Hey guys, welcome back. This is Alex Mershak, your most futuristic, non-ideological political philosopher king on the internet. Today we're going to talk about the iron law of democracy. What? No, there's no such thing? Today we're going to talk about the iron law of oligarchy. I've been reading through uh, James Burnham's classic book, The Machiavellians, which by the way is for free over on Audible, link in the description. And uh, on the request of a certain Moldbug Dementius, who, if you don't know about, well, you'll find out about him eventually. And if you do know about him, be quiet. Don't want to get it out there. Anyway, so we're going to talk a little bit today about uh, organizations and this thing we call democracy, which if most of you grew up in the kind of society that I grew up in, I grew up here in the United States of Michigan. I'm sorry, the United State of Michigan. I grew up in Michigan inside the United States of America. And uh, I, I was always made to believe all through school and even into college that really democracy was possible. And there was this thing called self-rule and self-governance, popular sovereignty. And it meant that everybody could come along and decide how they wanted to be ruled. Very cute story, very, very cute. They tell you this in grade school, they tell you this all the way through. It's sort of part of the, you know, standard neoliberal indoctrination, if you want to call that that. Let's just say it's just part of the normal standard indoctrination that, that every kind of child goes through because every regime needs to teach you that you're in this regime, and this regime is just, and this regime is the good regime, and it's the best regime we've got, you know? So don't complain too much, because there aren't any better alternatives, you know, to this democracy thing. This democracy. It's very important, this democracy. This is extremely, extremely dangerous, dangerous to our democracy. democracy. So uh, I'm, I'm reading through this book, and uh, he brings up this old theory by this uh, by this old-ass old uh, 19, 1911 uh, you know, Robert Michel's German sociologist who wrote this little book called Political Parties. And in Political Parties, he comes up with this theory called the Iron Law of Oligarchy. What is the Iron Law of Oligarchy? Well, it states that you always have to have garlic and olives with your pizza. The Iron Law of Oligarchy basically states that in any sufficiently complex society or organization, there will necessarily be an elite or a small group of people, also otherwise known as an oligarchy, who rule that organization and decide how things go. The reason for this being that it's practically impossible for these kinds of organizations, for large scale organizations of human beings, to be run in a truly democratic fashion. Now, of course, there's a compromise that we make on this here in the United States. Our founding fathers were not idiots. They didn't think that direct democracy was a good idea or practical in any sense or that it would work. And so they came up with this thing, this little thing called representative democracy, which is basically a conceit to this central theory in this book. Now, of course, this book was written long after the United States system of government was created. But Michel's here is just simply describing the way in which these systems tend to operate. So the basic idea is this, anyone claiming to rule by the people or to establish a system by which the people are the ones ruling or to even pretend as if there's some kind of pretense of democratic rule as such is basically lying. They're basically lying. And the reason being that it's just practically not feasible for these organizations to not be run by an elite group of people. This is a conversation that I've gotten into uh, on Twitter a little bit with various kinds of people, uh, especially in, in the populist movement, whether they're populist right or populist left. As I've said in uh, some of my prior videos, which you can link, find up in here, uh, that there, there is a kind of realignment happening right now in the United States. And the political realignment, one of the characteristics of it is that there are all kinds of new kind of factions that are popping up that aren't as clearly ideological in the traditional sense of belonging to one party or the other or to being on the left or the right so much as they are uh, positional in that they're more in favor of something like um, elite versus populist or globalist versus localist. And so these kinds of more nuanced cleavages that are actually about the organization and the distribution of things are showing up. 
And I think the internet is largely to blame for this. The fact of the matter is that the internet has opened up the landscape in such a way that all of our old narratives are basically becoming dissolved. And they're fracturing into infinite multiplicities of new narratives and various kinds of uh, splitting of internal groups. You know, whatever the, out, the in group was before is now becoming fractious. And people within the in group are now becoming part of the out group. And this is just going to have a cascading effect. And there's going to be fractal division all the way down on every conceivable level because of the fact that the internet has opened up the a gateway, to, so to speak, for revealed preferences, which eventually become discovered preferences. So they start as unconscious and then they eventually become conscious. What this means basically is that there's all kinds of new things to fight over that are no longer just Democrat versus Republican or left versus right or communist versus capital capitalist, whatever your previous ideological framing was for where people split along different political lines uh, is probably just outdated and it's just not going to work anymore going forward. So what does this have to do with this, this iron law of oligarchy? And why, why is Alex saying that democracy isn't really, really feasible? Well, the thing is, every group, including the populists, is necessarily going to be run by an elite group of people. So even the populist movement, whether you're a populist right or populist left, is necessarily going to be spearheaded and run eventually by the elites within that group, right? And so this is, a, this is an apparent paradox. It gets called out as a kind of performative contradiction sometimes because if you're a, a populist on the internet and uh, you're out there advocating for populist policies or populist ideals or populist government or, or whatever you want to call it, the elitists <laughs> will actually call you out for being hypocritical because they'll say, hey man, uh, you know, you're, you're out here advocating all these populist beliefs, but I've noticed, I've noticed you're not very populist yourself in terms of your hmm, educational background or hmm, your, your income level or hmm, your, your, your intelligence level. And the reason for this is this iron law of oligarchy. The fact of the matter is that there is no such thing as a real democracy. It doesn't exist. Anyone that's claiming to set up a democracy or to run a democracy or to be a tribune of the people is basically just either an oligarch or a wannabe oligarch who is setting things up for them to be in charge in the future, for them and their small group of buddies who are the in-group. And the same thing goes for all these populists. So it doesn't matter if you're Josh Hawley or AOT, if you're claiming to be a populist, but you're actually a person who's in a real leadership position, well then, by definition, you're not really a populist. And it's the nature of these movements, it's the nature of all large-scale political organizations, that they will be run by an intellectual, financial, cognitive, organizational elite. Because those are the people who have the capacity for ruling. Most people just don't have the capacity to rule. And so by default, what that means is that a small number of people are always going to be the ones who rule. Even this YouTube channel, you know, maybe you think of YouTube as a, a very, very democratic, very democratic platform. It's very democratic. Anyone can come on, anyone can make a video. But the truth of the matter is, <laughs> that YouTube on many, many levels is not democratic at all. Only a small percentage of the creators actually benefit. Only a small percentage of the creators get almost all of the views. And on, on top of all that, the YouTube organization itself is a US corporation that has a hierarchical structure, which isn't really democratic whatsoever because all the employees at YouTube don't really get a vote. They don't have equal stake in the running of YouTube, and even though they might have some kind of policy that purports to allow employees to have input in the way that things are run, and maybe they do make some significant concessions there, I, I don't really know, I don't really care. The fact of the matter is that even at, at the most basic level, nothing about this platform is democratic. And the same goes for all of the platforms, whether it's, whether it's Twitter or Facebook or Parler, doesn't matter. If it's run by human beings, it's not a democratic organization. And the same thing goes for governments. And so what we should think about 
when we're thinking about this iron law of oligarchy and its implications for us more generally is not only to be on the lookout for different kinds of, uh, of leaders or of demagogues who are trying to claim that they're speaking on behalf of democracy or that they're intending to make things more democratic because it's not really, as we've been over, not very practical, not really feasible. We should also consider whether or not holding these ideals of democracy in our minds and thinking that what we actually want is more democracy or what will actually be best for us is more democracy actually makes any sense in light of it. So that's what I wanted to leave you with today. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments. Do you think the iron law of oligarchy actually applies in all instances? Do you think that there is such a thing as uh, as a true democracy? Maybe there's some sort of secret, uh, some sort of secret ideal we haven't just uh, figured out yet or discovered. And um, I'll see you next time.